Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes presents The Big Story. Two phone conversations took place about the same time. One between a man named Tom Cooey and his wife. Don't talk like that, Tom. Don't. I can't help it, Celia. If he goes on like this, I swear I'll kill him. Ed Rumley's a crump. Tom, promise me you won't do anything. Some partner. Lazy, lies to me, never does any work, blames me. I swear one more stunt like that one in Galveston, and I swear I'll kill him. The other was between the first man's partner, Ed Rumley, and his brother. In Galveston, he pockets 50 bucks. I know it for a fact, Jack. 50 bucks. Then he tells me he took in 25 and splits that with me. Look, Ed, talk to him. He's your partner. Yeah, yeah, my partner. Some partner. Some swindler. But I'll tell you one thing, Jack. One more deal like that, just one. And Tom Cooey's gonna be a dead man. The Big Story. Here is America. It's sound and it's fury, it's joy and it's sorrow, as faithfully reported by the men and women of the great American newspapers. Little Rock, Arkansas. From the pages of the Arkansas Gazette... The story of a puzzle whose pieces would not match until a reporter put them together. Then they spelled murder. To Joseph Wurgis of the Little Rock, Arkansas Gazette, for his brilliant work in this jigsaw of crime, goes the Pell Mell Award for the big story. On the way to your throat. That's important. Pell Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Yes, Pell Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos means a longer, natural filter to screen and cool the smoke. Thus, Pell Mell gives you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Pell Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. That's important. Pell Mell's greater length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. If you really want to enjoy smoking, ask for the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell Mell. <laughs> story as it actually happened. Joe Werge's story as he lived it. Little Rock, Arkansas. All your life, you, Joe Werges of the Arkansas Gazette, did one thing well, police reporting. You did it so well, there wasn't a crime committed in Little Rock in the last 31 years, and most of Arkansas, for that matter, that you weren't connected with. Not just reporting it, but helping, sleuthing, asking questions, finding answers. So, at 55, you were something of a legend in Little Rock. No crime was complete without Joe Wurgis on the spot. And that was why you were sore at the young, new lieutenant of homicide, Sam Halder. Sore because the first you knew of it was when you heard Halder's report. Body found an empty lot adjacent to farm of Cy Travers, Rose City, two miles north of Little Rock. Dead one week, face disfigured, clues none, identification impossible. You got to the scene of the crime, Travers Farm, two hours after the police. Two hours. Usually you beat them by at least half an hour. With your son, Gene, a cub on the paper, you walk up to the new lieutenant two hours late, and say it right out. What's the idea? Huh? Oh, hello, Joe. What's the idea, Lieutenant? You know my son, Gene. Hi, Gene. Hello, Lieutenant. What idea? Well, don't I read anymore? Man's murdered, no clues, identification difficult. Don't you call me anymore? Ah, look, Joe, the weather's bad. I got the news at 7 this morning, and it's a goose chase. I didn't want to get you out of bed unnecessarily. I'm used to cold weather, bad weather, any kind of weather. And I like goose chases. 
Maybe you think I'm getting old, is that it? Ah, quit it. You know, I respect you and all that. Okay, okay. Now, what do you mean identification is difficult? On uh, my report, I said impossible. No such a thing, Lieutenant. Where is he? Down that dip where the cop is? Uh, Can I look? Take a few pictures? No such thing as impossible. <laughs> You're quite a guy, aren't you? Yep. Uh, let's walk on over. I wrote identification impossible on my report because, one, we don't know who's dead. Two, we don't know who killed him. Three, we don't find any clothes, no wallet, no identification whatsoever. How about on the underwear? Uh, four, if, if you let me finish. No identification on the underwear or anywhere around the scene of the crime. Oh, there's the body. Look, Gene, see him? Yes, Pa. Always look at a body from, like, uh, ten feet away. Gives you perspective, see? Uh-huh. I see, Pa. Now, take a picture from here, Gene. Then one from the feet. Then a close-up. I'll stay here and tell the lieutenant why I said identification is difficult, but not impossible. Now, you're bluffing, Joe. What tells you the identification? And not the identification, lieutenant. It just gives me ideas. Two men camped out in this field. One the dead man, the other the guy who did it. Footprints of two men are quite clear. Oh, well, okay, two men did camp out. Travers, the farmer, says a week ago two men asked to sleep out in this field. They had a car? Yeah. It looks like amateur crime, not a gangster killing. Gangster'd never pick a place like this, too open. Gangster'd never let himself be seen by Travers. Uh, so what? So, as amateurs, they bungled. Somewhere they bungled. Left something for somebody to find. Joe, I heard you theorize before, and, and I heard about how you solved cases, but honest... You never heard anything like this before. Well, exactly. Uh, Gene, you finished? Yeah, Pa. Okay, now over there. See? About a hundred yards over there. Papers. See? Uh -huh. Lots of little pieces of papers. Scattered all over. Are those scraps of junk? You don't mean to tell you me... Get that... a big bag, Gene. Pick up everything you see, even if you can't make it out. Okay, Pa. So, uh, what do you think you're doing? I said they were amateurs. Amateurs always leave something for somebody who can read it. Follow me? Joe, I'm afraid you're... Slipping? Getting old? Maybe so, Lieutenant. Maybe so. But I'd advise you not to file that report on identification impossible for 24 hours. Don't have to listen. Just my advice. Tired. Can't see anymore. Well, you go to bed, Jean. Why don't you stop shuffling these scraps of paper, Pa? You've been at it 20 hours and we haven't got a thing. You think the lieutenant's right, too. I'm getting old. I didn't say that, Pa. I'll sit with you all day tomorrow and the next day. Only... Only I sounded awful big, didn't I? 24 hours, lieutenant. I sounded swell-headed. Well, not exactly. Ah, now I think I got something. What, Pa? Look, Jean, a letter. Part of a letter, anyhow, in an envelope. This little piece in green ink, that did it. What have you got? The letter's signed Delia, see? Uh-huh. Lonely for you, Delia. And in the same handwriting, same ink, is this envelope. To Tom, C-O-U, and there's a letter missing, Y. C-O-U, blank Y. Yeah, but, Pa, that might not be the murdered man or the murderer. It might be, well, anybody. True. Might be someone who, uh picnic there a year ago, tore up the letter and left it there, right? Sure. Or maybe a passing motorist threw it out the window. Then why am I excited? Because it might also be the murdered man or the murderer. Right? Well, you begrudge me the answer. Mm, I suppose so. Never begrudge an aging father an answer. Come on, Jean. We're still under the 24 hours and I really got something for Lieutenant Halder. So, his name is C-O-U blank Y. Coolie, coolie, something like that. And he's got a wife named Delia. Uh, that's all, Joe? The letter was mailed from Bridgeport. Yeah, long shot, under the lawn. But I'll put a call through. You don't have to. Why? I already did. I put the call through, told the operator to connect you here at your office. As soon as she got a Mrs. Delia C.O.U. blank Y in Bridgeport. Well, I don't see... say it, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Halder, homicide. 
See you. Thank you. Hello? Uh, hello. This is Mrs. Delia Cooey. Oh, hello, Mrs. Cooey. Her name is Cooey. Uh, who is this? Uh, Mrs. Cooey. My name is Joe Wurgis from Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, nothing to be alarmed at. Just, uh, your husband's name is Tom. Is that right? That's right. Have you heard from him? Uh, no, ma'am. Just uh, just a routine newspaper check. Oh. Have you heard from him? No, I, I thought it was him calling. See, it's been a long time, over ten days, and he always writes or phones me. And... Has something happened? No, Mrs. Cooey, it's nothing definite. Just, uh, we may have some information for you. If we do, we'll get in touch with you. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cooey, how old is your husband? He's 32. Something is the matter. As I said, if anything comes up, we'll call you back. Don't worry. Uh... Why didn't you tell her, Joe? Tell her what, Lieutenant? Well, tell her to come down and identify the body. Well, it's her husband we found in the field. Oh, now, you know it as well as I. Might be. But then again, it might not. What are you talking about now? Did you take a good look at that body? I spent a day going over that body. Did you see his teeth? I saw his teeth. Are those the teeth of a man 32? A false upper plate? Well, it's happened before. Did you look at his feet? Bunions on his feet. Huh? Are those the feet of a man of 32? That man was 50 at least. Well, just because a guy has a plate in his mouth and bunions, well... Well, maybe he's a 32-year-old mail carrier. It's possible. But I say our man's 55 these a day. All right, I've said my piece. What are you going to do? File the death certificate in the name of Tom Cooey. What are you going to do? First, give you some free advice. Don't. And second, I'm going back and finish that jigsaw puzzle I've been working on with Gene. There's still a few pieces of paper have me worried. You've got Lieutenant Hall to worry. But you're worried too, Joe Urgis. A few pieces of paper have you worried. One, a half-torn receipt with a number... 73,569. And the other, the name of a post office. Hudson Terminal Post Office. On a somewhat similar piece of paper. You wonder if the two go together. If you have on the disarrayed table in front of you two pieces of a receipt for a registered letter. Well, suppose you have, Pa. Then maybe the amateur murderer tore up this receipt and we'll find his name. Oh, that's a thousand to one. At least two thousand to one, Gene. It might be the murdered man tore up the receipt, or it might be neither of them did it. Maybe it's 73,569 to one, Gene, but I like long shots. You play the long shot. A phone call to a friend in the post office at Hudson Terminal, and you find that the letter was mailed three months ago by a man named Ed Rumley to his brother Jack in Sacramento, California. So you put through a call to Sacramento. Uh, Mr. Rumley, uh, you've got a brother named Ed? That's right. He's about 55? Ed's 54. False upper plate in his mouth? That's right. Say, what is this? Bunions on his feet. Bad bunions. Yes, but what's this all about? Uh, Mr. Rumley, you'd better hop a plane and get out to Little Rock as soon as you can. I'm afraid your brother's been murdered. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment with tonight's big story. This is Cy Harris, returning it you to your narrator and the big story of Joe Burgess as he lived it and wrote it. First, Lieutenant Sam Halder announces that the identification of a murdered man is impossible. And you, Joe Wurgis of the Arkansas Gazette, prove that wrong. Then he announces that the murdered man is one Tom Cooey. And you blandly write a lead story for your paper that the murdered man is Ed Rumley. To be on the safe side... You don't run the story, because the identification by Rumley's brother 
on his way from California, hasn't been made yet. But when Rumley's brother arrives and takes one look at the body, you know you're right. The murdered man is Ed Rumley. So you run your story, and you and the lieutenant get on with the case. So your brother and Cooey were partners, Mr. Rumley. That's right, Lieutenant. And he and Cooey didn't get along. They hated each other. Yes, that's true. They were partners in business, sold auto polish together, and they weren't doing well. They fought a lot. Now, was it a surprise to you your brother was killed? I knew they had trouble, but I never thought it would come to this. You think Cooey did it? I don't know. Uh, why don't we let the man go to his hotel, Lieutenant? Huh? He's had a great shock, his brother's death and all that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mr. Rumley. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Joe, I think we sent out a dragnet for a man named Cooey. Tom, C-O-U-E-Y. Right? Right. But here, you're both wrong. It isn't two minutes later when the desk sergeant opens the door and lets in a tall man wearing a Palm Beach suit. Lieutenant Halder, I'm Tom Cooey. You're Cooey? Yes, sir. I have uh, read a story in the paper that Ed had been killed. I thought I could be of help and got here as soon as I could. Uh, where, where have you been? Well, as, uh, as you see, I didn't even bother to change my clothes. I was in Florida. I took a plane and got here as soon as possible. Ed was a good friend. Lieutenant, Gene's outside. You mind if I get him? No, go ahead, you. Do anything you like. Uh, sit down, Mr. Cooey. Uh, Any way I can help, Lieutenant? Well, just tell me. You and Rumley were partners? Yes, that's right. Auto polish lot. But uh, about three months ago, we broke up. We weren't doing too well. We split what we had. Ed took the stock. I took the car, and we just parted. Friendly? Why, Ed was the salt of the earth. You uh, have no idea how this distresses me. Just hold it, Mr. Cooey. What? Sure. The pictures. Go ahead, Gene. One from the side, then one from the front. Uh, well, what are you shooting pictures for now, Joe? Just routine. Oh, uh, Okay. Now, yeah, you were friends with Rumley. Were you ever in this territory? Oh, yes. Were you ever in Little Rock, Mr. Cooey? Recently, no. About six years ago, I was. But not recently? No. Ever in Knoxville? Uh, a year ago, for pleasure, but not recently. When did you last see Rumley? Well, uh, let me see now. Uh, must be four months ago. And where did you see him last? Richmond. We split up in Richmond, as I said. He took the stock, the polish, and I took the car, and... And that was... The last time I saw him, poor fellow. Uh -huh. Well, uh, thanks for coming in, Mr. Cooey. Lieutenant, can I say a word? You don't have to wish, but Joe. You aren't going to let him go, are you? Uh -huh. Maybe Travis ought to see him. The farmer? Uh -huh. One of them asked Travis for permission to camp on his farm. Remember? Yeah, I remember. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Cooey, I'll have to keep you for a uh, oh, few hours. Uh, make it 24, Lieutenant. Why? Uh, just to be on the safe side. Trust me. Uh, just a few hours, Mr. Cooey. Just routine. At the Travers, it was on your property they stayed that night, huh? That's right, Lieutenant. Now, just look at this man and tell me. Did you ever see him before? Was he one of the men? That man? Nope, never saw him before. Uh, satisfied, Joe? I'd still say make it 24 hours, Lieutenant. What? Given to an old man for him, Lieutenant. Okay. Okay. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Cooey. Just a few more hours. Where's Dean Wurgis? Dean, where are you? Here I am, Lieutenant. Now, where's Joe? Where's your father? Gee, I don't know, Lieutenant, but he said he'd be here. Well, I've been waiting half the day for him. He said he'd be here at six. Now, I'm going to let Cooey go. He said, please, to wait. 24 hours, he said, Lieutenant. 24 hours? What for? The man's innocent. Why am I holding him? Suspicion of murder? I've got no suspicion of murder. What's your old man doing, anyway? I don't know, Lieutenant, but he said, please, to wait. Well, it's 7. He's not until 8 o'clock. Not a minute more. Tell him that. I don't know where to find him. 8 o'clock. I don't care. <laughs> Yes, Lieutenant Holder. It's 8.15 and he's not here yet. Did you hear from him? No, sir, I didn't. Okay. Bring Cooey in, Sergeant. I'm releasing him. Don't be so hasty, Lieutenant. What? What, Pa? Did you find anything? I think it's a fine idea to bring Cooey in, but I don't think you ought to release him. Well, what did you find? Well, what have you got? Well, tell me. 
You ought to develop patience, Lieutenant. Gene, patience is an aspect in the old as well as in the young. You wanted to see me, Lieutenant Holder? Yes, Mr. Cooey, I did. Well, go ahead, Joe. Uh, Mr. Cooey, sit down in that chair. You'll be more comfortable than standing. Lieutenant? Yeah, go ahead, sit down. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I have a document here, Mr. Cooey. Just a second. That says... No, this is the letter I forgot to mail for my wife. Ah, here it is. A letter from your wife, Mr. Cooey. From Delia. From Delia? Oh, don't be alarmed. Perfectly harmless letter. Miss you, love you, write more often. But that's not what I'm after. It's the envelope I call to your attention. Well, what about it? The postmarks. Plural. Postmarks. This was sent to you in Knoxville, then forwarded to you in Little Rock. Note it bears three postmarks. Bridgeport, where she mailed it from, Knoxville, and Little Rock. Uh, so what, Joe? Suggesting that Mr. Cooey was at one time in Knoxville and later in Little Rock. Two facts which, if I remember correctly, he denied. Were you? Uh, well, I, I, uh, uh yes, yes, I, I guess I was. Now, with that much cleared, we ask this question. Uh, Mr. Cooey, were you ever in Rose City? Rose City, to refresh your memory, was the place where Ed Rumley met his death, on the farm of a man named Travers, in Rose City. Ever there? No, oh, never. Good. You also told us you never sold automobile polish in Knoxville or Little Rock or Rose City in the company of Ed Rumley. Yes, that's true. I was in Knoxville and Little Rock, but not with Rumley. We broke up in Richmond four months ago. I told you that. Oh, yes, so you did. But if it should be established that you did sell the polish in all those cities with Rumley within the past month, you might look like a liar. I said I never did, and that's all I've got to say. And here in my pocket I have... No, that's my telephone bill. Uh, here I have seven depositions from auto store owners in Little Rock and Rose City, swearing that you and Ed Rumley together sold them polish within the past month. Well, how could they swear that when I never... Do you recall my son took your picture? Well, armed with that picture and a photo of Mr. Rumley before you murdered him... I never did anything... With these photos, I say, I went to the auto stores and asked if they saw you. And uh, these depositions say they did. Seven, Lieutenant Halder. Seven. Fairly conclusive. All right, Cooey, let's have the truth. It's about time. Okay. Okay, we sold the polish together, but that's all. I left town two weeks ago and never saw Rumley again. Another lie. One of the depositions says you sold polish together the day of the murder one week ago. You hated him and he hated you. Rumley's brother says that, and so does your wife. As a matter of fact, you gentlemen both threatened to kill each other. Come on now, Cooey, start talking. Okay. We were in the field together. We, we camped out in Travis Field. We were broke. That's why we camped out. Rumley threatened me. We were about to go to sleep that night when he threatened me. I, I had to do it. He would have killed me. He had a club. Maybe, maybe it was the car jack. I don't know. And he tried to kill me. I took it away from him. It was self-defense. I, I didn't even think of what I was doing. Oh, how the man lies. Gene, note how criminals lie. First, it was premeditated. You removed not only his clothes, but also the uh, label from the underwear. You were careful to leave his body face down in the water, hoping it would leave him unrecognized. And do you know how I know that? Oh, it was not a hot night. The weather bureau with whom I have just checked tells me the night in question was a very cold night. You slept with your clothes on, and when the deed was done, you removed his clothes, you dragged the body 200 yards to the gully, and left it there. Do you want me to prove each of these points? Or will you sign the full confession I prepared for you? Well, I think Mr. Cooey needs a fountain pen, Lieutenant. Uh, you know he lost his in Travis Field. I found it if you want it, Mr. Cooey. But I don't think you'll have much use for it where you're going. Do you, Lieutenant? Well, Jean, we better get along. It's my... It's after nine o'clock. I'd better get to bed. You know, I can't take these late hours anymore. I'm not as young as I used to be. In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Joseph Wurgis of the Little Rock, Arkansas Gazette, 
with the final outcome of tonight's big story. That's important. Pell-Mell's Greater Length filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Pell-Mell's Greater Length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Thus, Pell-Mell gives you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Yes, Pell-Mell's are good. Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. So if you really want to enjoy smoking, ask for the longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Joseph Wurgis of the Little Rock, Arkansas Gazette. Realizing his story of self-defense wouldn't stand up in court. Killer in tonight's big story pleaded guilty to the murder and thereby escaped the electric chair. Sentenced to life imprisonment in the penitentiary, he escaped after serving four years, but was recaptured two years later. My sincere appreciation for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Wurgis. The makers of Pell-Mell famous cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week. Same time, same station. When Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Joliet, Illinois Herald News. Byline, William M. Hart. A big story about a reporter who tried to stop an explosion of dynamite. Human dynamite. <laughs> The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with music by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was written by Arnold Pearl. Your narrator was Bob Sloan and Martin Wolfson played the part of Mr. Wurgis. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic Big Story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the reporter, Mr. Wurgis. <laughs>